Had a lot of questions here lately about IR loaders and really just about cab sims in general. So I'm going to try to clarify and clear up a lot of the questions that I get about impulse responses, cab sims, and basically how do you use an impulse response and really what's it going to do for you? Why do people keep talking about it? And if you are familiar with it, which ones do you even need for your device like this or this or, you know, one of these? Like, wh what do you use? What size? What sampling? All right, so as we talk about this stuff, keep in mind, I'm really speaking in a very layman-esque way of why things are working the way they're working and how that's going to benefit you. So with the first question is this, and it's basically why would I want an impulse response or an IR loader of sorts and rather than like an analog uh, cabinet simulator? Wouldn't analog be better? And the, and the answer is really no. An analog cabinet simulator is really just a fancy, it's a fancy way of EQing something. An impulse response, the best way to think about it is it's a very accurate representation with EQ over time so it's literally mimicking exactly what you're going to have in the room at a given moment so for example whenever you play a really heavy chord through a big 412 cabinet you're it, it, whatever room you're in there's going to be some resonance for a minute while it bounces off walls and the cabinets resonating and all that sort of thing that's happening in the room that you hear is not just eq that's sound doing what sound does and that impulse response captures that through various mics. That's why there's so many different impulse responses that will be based around what type of mic that they use to capture it with, what speaker they're used in the cabinet, what type of cabinet, whether it was a 412 or a 212 or a 112, what size room they're in, like all these different things are all factors in the impulse response. And it's one of the reasons, one of the reasons why there are so many impulse responses available. There's a ton of them available everywhere. Not everywhere, obviously. Uh, many places if you look for impulse responses. Hey, if you still have questions about this, maybe I haven't explained it clear enough, probably not. Just leave a comment below if I get a bunch of comments and I'll, I'll make a better video really detailing the process here. Another big question that I get is, what type of impulse response should I use? I'm using a Moore, or I'm using a, a, a Nux, or I'm using a Strymon, or I'm using a Two Notes. I know it says Wampler, it's just a sticker I put on there. If at all possible, and I, I like to do this with my DAW because you have more processing power in a DAW rather than a little box generally. But if if I'm using it in my DAW, I, I usually go for 48K. The easiest way to explain that is, uh, let's say 48K uh, sample rate. That's basically going to allow that processor to reproduce up to uh, 24K, or give or take, in frequency. So that's that's way beyond what our human ears hear. Plus it's way beyond what a guitar cabinet really produces. So that's that's what I usually go with is 48K. 96, it's cool, uh, but I don't really see a whole lot of value as far as plugging into a guitar amp and using that. And then we talk about, you know, should it be 16-bit, should it be 24-bit? Go with 24-bit if you can. If you can't, 16 is fine. Length is something that's uh, a big discussion, and we'll actually do an example here in a minute. But something to keep in mind is that most of these devices, at least pretty sure almost all of them, I don't know all of them because I've never looked at all of them, but most of the devices, whatever you put into it, it's going to convert it to what it needs. So you're probably not going to put the wrong type in. It'll just convert it to what it needs. So as far as the length, milliseconds, like how long? 20 millisecond? Uh, 40 millisecond? 100, 200, 500, a million. That is the length of time it's capturing. There's a, so there's a great video that explains this in depth. I'll link it below. That's a great one to watch and to get a little more in the weeds on, on this. I like to use a 500 milliseconds or more. I also use a um, another impulse response. It's kind of like a room reverb. 
it's room, basically room mics. And I think that adds to the fullness of the sound. And I think that's how you get uh, that in combination with multiple IRs stacked in parallel. Um, not, not series, that's, that's one after the other. This is in parallel. It's a lot like having multiple mics all on the same amp. So when you run those impulse responses in parallel, it can give you a different or better sound, or maybe a more realistic sound. If you're wanting something that sounds like an amp in the room, you're going to have a series of room mics, or at least impulse responses simulating those room mics. So let's demonstrate that. First of all, let's take a quick listen of what the guitar sounds like in the room. I'm using a boom mic on this and it's pointed like opposite of the guitar amp. So it's a little muddy, but you'll still get an idea of what it actually sounds like in the room with the cabinet. Okay, for this example, I'm gonna show you what impulse response I'm using. It's a Celestian Creamback 412. So it's 412 cabinet with a cream back in it. And it's using the Royer 121 uh, microphone and it's balanced. So I believe when I looked at the documentation for the impulse responses, they have kind of a, a system of balanced versus bright versus there's some other names, how they describe where the mic position is in relation to the speaker. And it, it sounds like this. Now I do have just a little bit of reverb on these samples so it doesn't sound completely dry. And hopefully that doesn't make that much of a difference to you. Maybe it does, I don't know. All right, so let's go a little bit different on this one. Let's go with a 112 open back cabinet. We're going to use the G1265 from Celestian Impulse Response. And it's still a Royer 121 uh, microphone and it is still in the balanced position. Here's the new sound. <laughs> Okay, so let me show you what happens whenever we start paralleling impulse responses. So right now I have this front ribbon here. That's that's that same uh, impulse response I was originally using. It's Creamback 65, Royer 121, 412 cabinet. Now we're simply going to copy and paste that to different tracks. Each track has a different impulse response on it. So this one has a rear microphone. This one has one type of stereo room microphones. And this one has yet a different type of stereo room microphones. Let's listen to this back mic by itself. <laughs> Let's listen to just one of these room mics by itself. And the other room. Both rooms together. Now let's add in the front mic and the back mic. Okay, let's go ahead and compare that sound to just the regular one impulse response. This is just the Royer 121 ribbon in front of the cabinet itself. So what that does is it kind of gives you a bigger space, a bigger sound. So if you're using headphones, it's super handy because it doesn't sound so dry and, and two-dimensional. Kind of gives you a, sort of a stereo sound whenever you have headphones on. So really, really handy to parallel impulse responses whenever you're playing at home. And I would say if you're playing live, you probably don't want a whole lot of room stuff. Probably, maybe, I would probably make sense a back mic just because it sounds big and full when you're running through the mains, through the, through the PA. 
but I probably wouldn't do too much of the actual room impulse responses. So that's just my personal opinion. You may like it and it may work for you. That's great. There's really no absolute rules to things like this. Okay, now let's talk about one of the biggest arguments that uh, I can seem to find about impulse responses, which is simply the length of them. Some IR loaders use 20 milliseconds, some are 40, some are 100, some are 200, some are 500. Not much at 500 though, because the, um, the circuitry inside gets to be, has to be pretty powerful, and so that means it's more expensive. That's why you see very inexpensive IR loaders and also more expensive IR loaders. Also, some of them have capabilities to run from the amp in between the speaker and that allows you to get the sound of the amp as well, rather than just a, a line out. So it's a little different, and it's, um, you don't want to use an IR loader that's not made to go in between the amplifier and speaker. You don't want to use it there because you'll catch things on fire. Let's talk about the length of the actual impulse response. Um, I'm going to use the same impulse response from Celestion that I've been using. And what I'm gonna do is I can't actually find a 20 millisecond version of that. So I'm gonna try to use the software to shove it down to what would be 20 milliseconds and we'll see what it sounds like. So let's go to it. For the first clip, this is just the Royer 121 right on the front. So this is just that front mic. <laughs> Okay, so we just played the 500 millisecond clip. Now, if you look at this waveform, this right here is the, um, the waveform that's going to form the sound of that cabinet. So we can just take this length, scale it back, and change the length of the IR. But if you look at this, it's not a very long IR, so it's probably, when we take it down to 200, 100, probably even down even further than that, you're probably not going to notice that much of a difference. Maybe a little bit of loss in low end, because again, it's close mic'd, and it's, it's not picking up a whole bunch of room. So let's go ahead and start with, we'll go down to 200, then 100, and then 40 and 20. Uh, maybe just 20. <laughs> Let's go all the way down to 20. And just for fun, let's go down even lower. So if you're just going to use a mic on the front, you know, like if you're taking your IR loader to a gig, it's probably gonna be fine. The biggest difference is gonna be the circuitry inside. So some of those IR loaders have have really fancy, um, I'd hesitate to say better, or, but different uh, circuitry surrounding that. So it, it might do different things to the audio, it might make it a little warmer, might make a little less noise, like all kinds of different things. So one IR loader compared to the other one, even though if they both do, let's say 200 milliseconds, but one's more uh, more inexpensive versus the other, it, it's hard to say exactly what's going on, but it could be different processing. It could be uh, the different circuitry, different converters. So the actual piece that converts to digital and back to analog and so on, those can be different quality as well. So there's a lot of different things that go in to just making that cabinet simulator um, sound like a really good amp using impulse responses, or really good cabinet rather, using impulse responses, and um, you know, and the expense of it all. So there's there's a lot that goes into it. Okay, so from so that was the speaker on the front. I'm sorry. So that was the microphone on the front. Let's uh, use a longer IR. Let's use the room IR so we can see what happens then once we start using shorter impulse responses. Okay, so again, this is the room IR, 500 milliseconds. So it's the full length. Here we go.
All right, so let's take that down quite a bit. Let's say uh, 100 milliseconds. So we're noticing a difference there for sure. So we just did 100, let's go to 40. Big difference there. 20 milliseconds. So a gigantic difference there. And just for the sake of fun, let's go back to 200 milliseconds so you can compare that with the 200 millisecond. All right, so overall, what I would say is if you have a, a inexpensive IR loader and it can only do 20 milliseconds, it will work just fine. It really will. Uh, if you can afford a better one, do that. It will probably sound better. And again, if you spend a little bit more money for something like, you know, like the two notes and there's some other devices that will allow you to connect it between the head and the speaker, and that will also allow you to go straight out to mixers and et cetera. Just, it just gives you a better sound whenever you can use a guitar amp along with your pedal board and get the, uh, the convenience of the impulse responses. If not, then just run it from your pedal board. If you don't want to do that and you want a little bit better sound, maybe use a preamp after your pedal board and then go to your impulse responses. So I hope this helped you. Consider subscribing if you're not subscribed and uh, check out the videos up here. That's probably like right there. So we'll see you in the next video.